It's time to get educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. This is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dr. Duke Show. We got a great show for you today, so please hit that share button to keep us growing. Today, we start with Nicole Hannah-Jones' expanded New York Times 1619 project. The expanded best-selling book is now on Amazon, is now being destroyed by historians across the country. So in case you are unaware of who Hannah Jones is or uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, there she is her trademark uh, bright red dyed hair. She is a, a, a journalism professor. She's actually a journalist, uh, was for the New York Times. Now she's a university professor at Howard University, even though she doesn't have a PhD or a final credential. And the thing about her that is so uh, uh, disturbing is she's not a historian. She has never been a historian. You may remember a number of years ago now, a few years ago, she created the 1619 History Project. And the, uh, the whole point of this is to pick a one aspect of American culture to study American history only through that aspect of culture to ignore anything that doesn't fit the prefab narrative. And of course, to the surprise of nobody, she picked slavery, right? And so uh, let's ignore 1620. Let's ignore uh, the Mayflower before even the Mayflower made it to this country as early as 1619. America was a land of slaves, which of course it wasn't. But that's part of the lie of Hannah Jones' work. So uh, this, if you, this, this goes back to uh, Howard Zinn, really. If you go back to the 1970s and you think about the degree to which Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States became, the, became, became really the only pro, uh, chosen textbook for American history. And Zinn's books did exactly this. They looked at American history only through the lens of Marxist socialist dialectic. So what did they find out? That America hates unions and America is a deeply class-based system that uh, poor people can't get ahead in, that the elite rich control and own everything. I mean, you would think, uh, the, by, by the way Howard Zinn talked about American history, that we had no social no- mobility in the country, whatever. There was nothing else that mattered in American history other than pertain to Marxist socialist values. And so kids in the 70s were getting a completely skewed v- view of socialism, which is one of the reasons why you have two generations now, two and a half generations now of young people under the age of 35 who grew up under, with a, a socialist critique of American history, not American history. American history filtered through the lens of left-wing socialism. So along comes Hannah Jones and with no history credentials whatsoever and without any really, no teaching experience and you know without the credentialed uh, PhD to go along with it, Hannah Jones becomes the originator of the 1619 curriculum, and that starts uh, a year before the Mayflower, and it's all made up history. Uh, Take a look at the uh, cover of the book there. Uh, This is the expanded book of the New York Times 1619 project. Since the two years ago when this was introduced, there were so many historical inaccuracies, so many downright lies that uh, university, real serious university professors, many of them liberals, not conservatives, blasted the book and blasted the project. It is a lie and a lying way to make Americans hate their own country. It has very little truth in it was the the argument. And so what happened? So the 1619 project was controversial from day one. Um, I think you know that some schools embraced it in their curriculum. Some states banned it. A small group of historians claimed there were inaccuracies and Republicans true to form, weaponized it like they're doing now with critical race theory. So what is your reaction to all of that? Well, I think if you want to do something ambitious that uh, really uh, reframes our understanding of America in a country that has not wanted to deal with the legacy of slavery, it's going to be controversial. And frankly, um, if everyone embraced the project, the project probably would not have succeeded at making the arguments that we were trying to make. I am surprised, though, that states are actually banning the teaching of the project. Um, We have a First Amendment for a reason. We are a country that says we believe in free speech. And if you don't like an idea, then come up with a better one. All of this fanfare, all of this tenure, all of this unearned scholarship and money and prizes simply 
specifically for writing a history book that is A, full of lies, and B, completely tangential to the main story of American history. Congratulations, Hannah, for all your bitching and moaning about capitalism. Cha-ching, baby. Today's show is sponsored by our friends at MyPillow. Save up to 66% on all items at MyPillow.com when you use the code Dr. Duke. That's D-R-D-U-K-E. Support this show by supporting a great American company. Happy birthday, go away. Happy birthday, go away. Happy birthday, go away, Joey. Happy birthday, go away. Don't worry, that video was from seven years ago when Joe was still in his 70s. This is a, uh, a big day. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, as my mother would say, former Senator Danny Noway is looking down going, finally, finally. And that video was less than a week until Joe's big birthday, 79, which he turns on November 20th. He's overcome so much to get to where he is now as the leader of the free world. Finally, this systemically ageist country can say it has a president who is 79 years old. He is an inspiration to all senior citizens, crushing with his dentures the stereotypes that older people can't be president. He has shown that you can fart, poop, sleep, and do all the things at his age and be in charge of launch codes. Which brings us to today's question. What are you getting Joe Biden for his birthday? Let me know in the comments. And if you could share this video, then I can afford to light up 79 candles so Joe can blow them out with his back end. Now back to it. In full disclosure, that last clip I showed you wasn't actually Biden talking about his upcoming birthday. In fact, he didn't know what was going on, which is par for the course. You know, uh, here we go. Where is everybody? Jill. <laughs> Jill Sierra, the Attorney General. We got the whole guy. Everybody's there. All right, Jill. I don't know what was going on back there, but I. They're all here. Okay. I was worried you weren't going to come out and hang out with <laughs> me. Joe spoke this week at the Tribal Summit where he signed the executive order on improving public safety and criminal justice for Native Americans and addressing the crisis of missing or murdered Indigenous people. But to kick it all off, Joe went with a view of himself that I think most of us would prefer. Next time in Washington, okay? I see you all up on the, up on the board behind me, and I hope we do this in person. I hope, I hope, I hope. That's my, that's my hope. Thank you. I hope, I hope, I hope there isn't a next time. That's my hope. Later in the day, Biden signed the whomper of an infrastructure bill that has but a little bit of infrastructure in it, and it only costs $1.2 trillion. It was a momentous moment where they couldn't get anything right, much like passing and signing a $1.2 trillion slap in the face to be added on to the already annual federal deficit sitting at $2.8 trillion. Anyway, they don't know what's going on and they don't care. Please welcome Heather Kurtenbach. In a moment. <laughs> Ouch, she just got skipped. That brings us to... Where in the world is Kamalama Lama Ding Dong? <laughs> Did anyone know it was actually her birthday exactly one month prior to Joel's old day? No? In the world of no one cares, did anyone care? No. Maybe we didn't know because she was busy at the border. No. Or maybe she was solving the climate crisis or something. No. Surely she wasn't hiding out in her office, just answering emails. <laughs> really? Oh, Joe. Oh, I'm very surprised. Thank you. <laughs> Don't say that. He'll really do it. Thank you. Oh, I'm gonna hang this up with great pride. Thank you, Mr. President. 
You have to go back and listen, but that exchange really did sound like a grandfather giving his granddaughter a gift. She's all giddy, and he already forgot where he was. What's the over-under on her immediately trashing all of those gifts? You tell me. Now, in terms of where Kamalama Ding Dong is now, this past week she spent four days in Paris, France. You are correct. That is nowhere near the southern border of the United States, and she's there to embarrass this country yet again by being the fakiest of all fakes. With us in government, we campaign with the plan. Uppercase T, uppercase P, the plan. And then the environment is such that we're expected to defend the plan. Even when the first time we roll it out, there may be some glitches and it's time to reevaluate and then do it again. Oy vey. Her French accent is as bad as her cackle. Which one is more fake? Well, you tell me. But as Frenchie says, there may be some glitches, time to reevaluate and then do it again. Remember, this is the same inauthentic VP who last month had child actors sit with her to talk about space. But how dare I say anything bad about the vice president who has earned herself a pitiful 28% approval rating. You know it's all because of the racism and the sexism. Kamala's approval rating uh, of 28% is even lower than the 30% who approved of Dick Cheney in 2008 after he shot a guy in the face. <laughs> I think these people are forgetting that at least 10% of, the, of those polled approved of Dick Cheney because he shot a guy in the face. I think I know why Kamala's ratings are low, besides sexism and racism, which are the obvious ones. It's because whenever she's next to Joe, standing near him, behind him, she looks like an assassin. Thanks, Jimmy Kimmel, for your still unfunny self. And regarding Joe's poll numbers, which we talk about almost every week because every week they seem to get worse, just know they're still in the trash. And Biden says that, you know what? Americans don't feel it. Even though we've created almost six million jobs since I came into office, we're in a situation where people don't, I mean, they don't feel it right now. They don't feel it. You got to feel it. Biden's chief of staff, Ron Klain, is the ever spinster who told CNN's Jake Tapper that, in fact, we all should be grateful since, you know, things are a lot better than they were just one year ago. Well, look, I do think, as I said, Jake, I think things are a lot better in this country than they were a year ago with regard to COVID, with regard to the economy. But we have a lot of work left to do. And I think voters are in a show me, don't tell me mode. I don't think they really care as much about what I'm saying on TV or what you're saying on TV as much as they do about us putting results uh, into their lives. You got that last part right. I'll do a show me for all of you even though I'm not from Missouri. I'm from the state that is forward, so I'll be forward. As you saw earlier with Biden handing Harris a birthday present, Joe also wants to give back on his birthday to all of us. And he already has been in the form of increased inflation. Well, gold, darn it, it actually sped up last month instead of slowing down like the Washington folk wanted it to. So consumer prices are up 6.2% from a year ago. Maybe Ron Klain didn't see that report before he went and talked to CNN. And then there's that, that dang price of gasoline. We won't say gas because it'll confuse flatulence Joe with his little tummy issues. Look, our view is that the rise in gas prices over the long term makes it an even stronger case for doubling down our investment and our focus on clean energy options. Double down so that your heating costs this winter will be double the cost. It's simply economics. But, but I'll let Joe tell us about economics. We got higher demand for goods at the same time we're facing disruptions in the supplies to make those goods. There's a res this is a recipe for delays and for higher prices. And people are feeling it. They're feeling it. Do you ever think you'd be paying this much for a gallon of gas? In some parts of California, they're paying $4.50 a gallon. That's why it's so important that we do everything in our power to stabilize the supply chain. Unfortunately, the obtainment of fentanyl was not impacted by the supply chain. The New York Times reported that more than 100,000 Americans died of overdoses, which is up almost 30% from last year. Federal researchers reported that the overdoses are the result of lost access to treatment, rising mental health problems, and wider availability of dangerously potent new street drugs. What was that again, Joe? We're in a situation where people don't, I mean, they don't feel it right now. They don't feel it. All those drugs coursing through his veins make him feel nothing as well. Now, don't get me wrong. There are plenty of people in their late 70s who are competent and still working. Here's the rub. They are competent. And then we have Joe. I know you're 
a little younger than I am. But, uh, you know, I've adopted the attitude of the great Negro at the time, pitcher in the Negro Leagues, went on to become a great pitcher in the pros, into the Major League Baseball after Jackie Robinson. His name was Satchel Page. Remember, though, Joe is in great health all around. He still hasn't released the report on his health like he promised he would back in May, but, you know, just trust him. We are going to wrap this up by doing a little comparison. Joe turns 79 in a few days. My daughter is about 7.9 months old. And in many ways, they're the same. They're farting, pooping, and sleeping like all good babies do. But she has had two-week, two-month, four-month, and six-month checkups compared to Joe's nothing. Maybe he's being a big baby about it and throwing a tantrum, or maybe everyone around him knows what the results will show. Because we all do. So, happy birthday, Joe. May you remember where you are, who you are, and how to blow out your candles. Don't suck, because you've done enough of that for all of us. Please show that you, dear Team Healthy Republic member, don't suck by sharing this video. Until next time, let's go Brandon and stay healthy, America. Joined now by our international correspondent, Alex Newman. Alex, it's always great when you are in studio. We appreciate you coming. Uh, the long trip from Miami to Wisconsin. It's good to see you. It's great to be here. We have a Columbia professor who states something that anybody who pays attention to education should know, that the public school system, the American public school system, is unconstitutional. What does he have to say? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting that this argument is getting traction. Dude, this column was actually published, it's, this op-ed was published in the Wall Street Journal, one of the biggest newspapers in the country. This is obviously a, a very prominent individual, law professor at Columbia University, and he's taking an interesting approach because uh, just some months ago, uh, former Attorney General Bill Barr, uh, he was uh, Trump's Attorney General, um, he made the argument that the government school system was unconstitutional for religious reasons. He said, you know, they're, they're forcing the state's chosen religion, non-theism, atheism, evolution, whatever, uh, on Christian children. And Christian taxpayers are forced to finance this false religion being taught to their children. And I think that's a good argument. Uh, this guy actually takes a, a different tact. He says it's even broader than that. Uh, it's a free speech argument. Uh, parents have the right to exercise their free speech and teach their children what they want. But what's happened here is the government has created a system where uh, because of the high property taxes, because of the expectation that children go to school, because of the incentives that children go to government school, that the government is substituting the parents' right to speak to their children for the government's right. right. So it's a very interesting argument. And you know, I, I can think of nothing better than having the public school system ruled unconstitutional. Well, join those two arguments together and you have a huge onslaught against the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Stunning, isn't it? But again, I mean, not to be that guy, but <laughs> how much of this didn't we know? I mean, and here's my question to you as a, as, a, as a long term scholar of the public schools. We both have studied it for a long time. Where was this kind of talk in 1979? Where was, where, where was the Reagan administration? For that matter, for all Trump's talk during his 2016 run for president that he was going to get rid of the Department of Education, uh, once he became president, zip nothing nada. I've always wondered why there hasn't been, at least going back to 1975 and the creation of the Department of Education, uh, for, for the first time you forced a federal entity to be in control of a large swath of education policy. Why was this not challenged a thousand times between now and then? Yeah, it's a very good question, Duke. And in fact, uh, going all the way back to when this was made official, um, the, there was a Supreme Court justice, uh, uh, Potter Stewart was his name, and he wrote a dissent in these cases in the early 1960s where the feds really uh, got their nose under the tent, the camel's nose under the tent. They said that it was unconstitutional to have prayer in schools, it was unconstitutional to have Bible in the schools. They actually cited the First Amendment, believe it or not, right. which was ludicrous. I mean, the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law. <laughs> it doesn't say anything about the state of New York or a little school district in Pennsylvania. So they, they relied on the 14th Amendment. They said, well, the 14th Amendment uh, uh, establishes all the other amendments onto the states. So they said that requires that you no longer be able to teach the Bible or prayer in school. Well, one of the justices who wrote the dissent in these cases, Potter Stewart, he actually teed up this argument perfectly for them. He said, what's happening here, folks, is not the establishment of uh, neutrality with respect to religion, but rather the establishment of the religion of secularism. Right. That was the key argument right there. And They're forcing a false religion 
uh, which is completely illegal under the First Amendment for the federal government, on the states, on the local communities, and on the parents. And by definition, setting up a hostile relationship with religions like Christianity. That's right. Right? Because you have, you're pitting them against each other. And so, yes, and so, but that's been around for 50, 60, 70, almost, 60, almost 70 years now. So why is it that no one else has picked it up? There's been such turmoil over education, certainly since the mid-90s all the way to today. I mean, there's been uh, goals through thousand by the, the Clinton administration. No child left behind was terribly, terribly controversial. Common core, critical race theory. Why is this, uh, is it one of those things where people have gotten so used to the public schools? So it's, it's part of our specular DNA now that some stranger is going to teach our kids six, seven hours a day, uh, that we've no longer see any hope of removing that because it seems to me that you know again the precedent has been set but you could sure shake a rat rattle a lot of cages by pushing a first amendment case on these two points against the public schools yeah absolutely and i think if the federal courts were fair if we could find justice in the federal courts this would have happened decades ago it's it's, it's plain and simple but I, I think what's going on now duke something very significant um the public school system is the goliath it's a trillion dollar a year monstrosity that is gobbling up our children, chewing them up and spitting them out in, in you know, ragdoll form. Uh, and, and at this point, parents are now up in arms all across this country. You've got tens of millions of parents who are fed up to here. And I think the establishment is starting to realize, wow, we uh, the, the Goliath is going down. We got to start making backup plans. And I think one of their backup plans might be, and I hope I'm wrong here, but they're, they're getting ready for the collapse of the public school system and what they want to say. And actually, this is what the, uh, the argument in the Wall Street Journal makes from this Columbia Law professor, Professor Hamburger. We need to start giving parents tax money to go to the school of their That's choice. Exactly right. And once they do that, the hooks are going to come too, and then they're going to say, "Well, yeah, you can have your private school, you can do your homeschooling, but you got to have accountability. You got to teach with these standards. Everybody has to know these basic things." There's talk now that uh, emanating from some states that teachers, uh, homeschool moms, have to be certified. To yes, teach. yeah, you got to have a teacher this. certificate. That's exactly right. So it's and, dangerous. Well, here's the maybe the hope uh, because we 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 all knew this from the beginning that they're not doing this to sixty million American public school kids in order to leave private and homeschool kids alone. Sooner or later, they're coming. And I would throw this out there for homeschool moms and homeschool the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, for instance. When they do start formally coming from the for the, the privileges of homeschooling, now you start to go back and look at these First Amendment cases. Maybe you drag that back in. You don't just play defense. You play offense against this behemoth and go back to what we should have been protesting all the way since 1962. Yeah. And, and folks, this is an absolutely critical battle. We've seen the dominoes falling. Sweden has banned homeschooling. Germany, uh, France, now Portugal. Uh, the dominoes are falling. They're laying the legal groundwork here in America through the Arizona Law Review. We had this crazy article published by the Harvard Law professor, uh, Elizabeth Bartholet, saying that homeschooling needs to be banned presumptively because it deprives children of their rights. So this is a very serious legal attack. They're getting ready to go full force on this. And folks, if you're a homeschooler, if you're an attorney, you better be ready because they're coming. Today's show is sponsored by Clean Start Hand Sanitizer. For an odor-free foam hand sanitizer that lasts two hours and provides 19 refills, visit freedomproject.com slash clean. That's K-L-E-E-N to order yours today. Joined now by Tina Griffin, the counterculture mom. Tina, how are you doing? I'm doing excellente. How are you doing up there in Wisconsin? Don't hey, you, you know you, there? Hey, you got your Green Bay Packer hat on. <laughs> I gotta, you know, connect with the uh, Midwest up there. You're, you know, the you're Lambeau repping, Field. You're repping it. You're repping it. All right. Hey, well, hey, hey, Packers finally win one again. We got to make sure Rogers stays COVID free. Well, hey, as long as he gets a haircut, it's fine with me. <laughs> I like his long hair. Okay, let's get, oh, sorry. Well, we have a great topic today. It's the, uh, the, the new series, raunchy series, I Know What You Did Last Summer, which is a series based on a really bad horror movie, but now it's a, an actual series. What do you know about this? Well, sad to say, I actually saw the movie that came out in 1997, freaked me out for a couple of weeks. I should have never saw it. But what I do know now is there's a common theme in today's entertainment. We got drugs, sex, violence, usually without any consequences. Shame on Hollywood. But this is exactly what you'll find in a new series on Amazon Prime. I know what you did last summer. The teen horror series began in 1973 as a novel, raunchy film in 97. Bad mistake to watch that. 
But the content now in this movie pales in comparison to the extremely inappropriate content that is now in the TV series rated TV mature, even though they target it towards teens, which we're going to see here in a second. This party is about to get too big. I love this song. I'm here with the OGs. I need a burrito. <laughs> No one will really know what we did. Did anyone see us that night? No. Why do you ask? We were all the worst people I know. Totally fake. Sociopath. Drug addict. All you do is lie. You had sex with the one person I love. Hello? It was fine until she came back. She's not who we thought she was. You need to tell the truth. What if I don't know the truth? There is no redemption in this life. Good! It's brutal out here. Now, the sexual content includes nudity, foul, uh, foul language, full frontal male nudity, detailed oral sex instruction. Like our kids need that. Planned Parenthood is just going to have more people coming in their office, which is what they want. And Planned Parenthood's in bed with Hollywood. We've talked about that before. Teens are having sex, vulgar terms for body parts, violent death scene, gruesome sights, uh, and heavy language is used throughout this entire movie. Uh, the main character sells drugs. Teens are seen doing cocaine, smoking pipes, having sex. I mean, this is crazy. Common Sense Media reported that the more sexual content kids watch on TV, the earlier they are likely to have sex themselves. That's a no-brainer. Even the American Academy of Pediatrics says that when kids see drugs or alcohol advertised on TV, they're more likely to use it, do it, get involved with it. And the consequences aren't revealed, Dr. Duke. That is my main worry, is we're going to see a skyrocketing number of STDs next year, kids that are pregnant at 13, and everything else. There was that one st comment at the end by the lead actress, there is no redemption in life. What kind of an anti-Christian worldview is that? It's a really messed up one, but you and I are all about solution. I need 30 seconds to rattle off some top solutions for parents so they're not like thinking, okay, so we're not going to watch it. What can we do? Well, we need to teach God's design for sex to our kids. That's what they need. That's what you parents want. We highly recommend the Biblical Sex Ed series, Life Choices. You can get five bucks off when you use the code TINA. All that information is surrounding this alert in our Counterculture Mom app. Uh, regarding this movie. All the links are right there in the solution, solution section of our app. You'll love those alerts. Parents can also check out more information about TV shows their kids are interested in with sites like Common Sense Media, Plugged In, Movie Guide, and Kids in Mind. All of those in our Counterculture Mom app. Click on Premium, get all the information. We also have VidAngel offering all the people that have the Counterculture Mom app and click on Premium gets their streaming services, which is a content filtering system that you're already using these streaming services anyway. Get it for a buck for the first month just by using the code word TINA. Those are some starter tips that I've had that I have here as a counterculture mom for families to get the right design of sex in the home for our kids so they can grow up healthy, wealthy, and wise. And that's gonna do it for this show. I'm Dr. Duke. Until next time, stay educated, my friends.